Good morning, I'm Kristen Belasia, Head of Automotive Advisory at IHS Market, and welcome to this edition of Fuel for Thought. Today, I'm joined by my colleagues, Mark Fulthorpe, Executive Director, Light Vehicle Production, and Phil Amsrud, Senior Analyst, Semiconductors and Components. Good morning, gentlemen. Hello, Kristen. Good morning, Kristen, or good afternoon from here in Europe. Absolutely. So, gentlemen, after a year of pandemic-related pressures to the auto industry, March 2021 was the strongest for the month for U.S. new vehicle sales in over 20 years. However, what we're here to talk about today is those circumstances and undercurrents of further disruption that were already going on and have since really exploded, causing dramatic actions that we've seen, such as a number of manufacturers disrupting production, including the iconic F-150. Uh, so we want to talk a little bit about uh, what's going on there, what we're what we've already seen, and what we're likely to see moving forward. So, Mark, if we start with you, uh, as I mentioned, it was a strong start to the year in general, and certainly compared to last year. Level set us on what we're seeing as we cross the halfway mark of 2021, and what the impact of the semiconductor shortage has been thus far. Sure. Well, as you say, I mean, it couldn't couldn't have been any worse than last year, of course. Um, and I think part of what we're seeing in these high levels of activity, which really probably started to emerge, first of all, in China last year, as, as early as late Q1, but continued throughout the year, uh, and then were picked up in markets in North America uh, and in Europe, it was really, you know, that sort of strong pent up demand, which had been deferred from the, uh, you know, the peak um, of the pandemic crisis. So, you know, that started to, to come through um, and that really kind of laid the foundations to many of the issues that we're faced with now in the industry. So, you know, very, very strong demand coming back. Uh, I think in the sector that we're going to focus on on this podcast today, semiconductors, you know, there was a sense that some of the semiconductor suppliers they didn't really believe in the strength and speed of the uh, the recovery, which was being signaled by the automotive sector. Um, and they might have been, I guess, uh, a little more believing of, of, of the Chinese industry because that had started to recover from, as I say, late, late in March last year. But elsewhere in the world, as we sort of, you know, we went through much of Q2 seeing downturns. Um, I, I think, you know, there was a sense of not skepticism, but they wanted to see proof in, in front of them uh, before they start to supply to what was looking like, um, you know, heightened levels of automotive demand. Well, those heightened levels of automotive demand, you know, they continued through much of Q3 and Q4 and spread out around the world. Um, and, you know, that left us in a position that as we turned into 2021, um, you know, there was, um, you know, still this very strong underlying level of demand and of course manufacturers were trying to translate that strong underlying level of demand into strong orders from the semiconductor sector um but there were some i guess we're you know we're starting to see that there were some structural issues which became apparent uh, uh within that environment um you know one of which we've just touched on was kind of this you know did you believe in the demand were you prepared for, for that demand um, but I think, you know, the, the other one was that it highlighted the fact that much of the semiconductor industry had started to move away or de-emphasize the importance uh, of automotive um, as new customers came through, particularly uh, in the consumer electronics uh, sector. So that created some difficult conditions, which we picked up on in, in, in Q1. Um, you know, if you've been following the trackers that we provide to clients each week, you know, we estimate there are about uh, 1.4 million units or so of light vehicles which weren't built in the first quarter. Um, and that really, you know, that reflects, you know, the, the the difficulties or the imbalances in the supply chain around semiconductors. There were some, you know, some, some additional uh, peripheral disruptions as well, but primarily it was the semiconductor sector. Uh, and then in Q2, which were, you know, were, were just about to close out, like you said, Kristen, you know, the disruption has accelerated. Um, and I think, you know, there we would see that the um, the problems that we inherited in Q1 were made worse by, uh, you know, a, a number of topical disruptions 
which hopefully as we start to look towards the second half of the year and into uh, to 2022 uh, that we, we you know we won't have to deal with those again um, but we you know we're talking about you know layering on top of the uh, the imbalances that we had already identified you know, severe weather impact down in Texas which hit in February but has kind of played out through Q1 and into Q2 um, of course there's a very high profile fire which broke out um, at the Japanese facility, the NACA 3 facility um, for the major supplier, uh, Renesas. So, you know, those issues compounded the uh, the imbalances that we saw in, um, you know, coming into to 2021. So I, I don't know if Phil wants to add anything on, on, on perhaps on a little, that bit of a background before we could perhaps come back and, and take a look at how we see the rest of the year playing out. No, I think you you hit on all the all the correct um, high points, Mark. Uh, you know, COVID was was kind of the initial stressor that set everything up, um, and that took us into late last year. Um, and then, as we got into this year, uh, there were mismatches between the the demand and the capacity within the semiconductor supply chain, and then the the real wild card was the uh, the storm in Texas and the fire in um, uh, at Renesas that uh, that disrupted things. So that that kind of got us to where we are right now. So so Phil, interesting that that I guess Phil and Mark that you mentioned all of those things. And now on top of that, you know, there's some additional potential turbulence brewing. Um, you know, and and we're hearing about this uh, availability of large supply of ultra pure water. Phil, can you talk about about the importance and and potential risks associated with that? Yeah, I mean TSMC's who's the the, the largest um uh semiconductor foundry in the world. Um they they consume millions of gallons of water daily. Um Taiwan is also in a 50 year, 53 year drought right now. And some of the reservoirs are somewhere between 10 and 20% of capacity. Um, so that, that's a, it's a volatile combination. You've got limited water largely because uh, of the, the storms that didn't materialize last year and haven't materialized uh, in enough quantity yet this year that set up the, the stage for not having a lot of water. And the semiconductor industry um, is a major consumer of water. Uh, I think in Taiwan in particular, after agriculture, the next largest consumer of water is semiconductors. Um, so if you don't have water, uh, you, you don't make semiconductors because you need it both to clean the impurities um, off the wafers as they're being processed, but it's also part of the uh, immersion lithography that uh, is necessary for you know, the more advanced pr uh, process nodes at these foundries. So, you know, water is one of those things that doesn't get talked about a lot in um, in semiconductors, but if you don't have it, it's as critical to your operation as not having power. Interesting. So, so with all of that um, in consideration, Mark, you had talked about and kind of set this up, when do we expect the supply situation to improve? And if so, you know, or not if so, when, when the flow of goods are, are no longer um, significantly hindered, should we expect to return to prior levels? Should we expect to see an increase in demand as the industry tries to compensate for lost production and sales? Well, I think sales, first of all, I think sales are holding up pretty well at, at the moment. Um, there's not widespread evidence um, of you know lost retail uh, or, or um, activity from the consumer at this stage. Um, so we, we you know we, we'll hope that that can persist while the kind of you know the supply and manufacturing side of it um, hopefully you know get a, a better handle on uh, on events, which is kind of you know the the way that we're expecting the balance of, of the year to to play out. Um, you know, clearly the confluence of, of events that we've seen in Q2, you know, driven far greater disruption even than, than we saw in, in the first quarter. Uh, we think it's probably somewhere in the, in the, the region of two and a half million units, which would be, be lost from the, the global build. But as we turn towards Q3 uh, and then to Q4, um, 
you know, the, like I said before, the, the one-off impacts which, which hit us in late Q1 but affected Q2, we don't expect them to be replicated. Of course, Phil's just touched on the, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the real elephant in the room, which is the, uh, the, the situation of water supply in Taiwan. But if we assume that we can come through that, um, then I think we start to come back to kind of the fundamentals, which would be um, as we go Q through Q3, yes, there will spill, still be levels of disruption um, within the, the supply chain. That, that, that's for sure. Um, but we don't expect it to be uh, at the level that we've seen in, in Q1 or uh, the exaggerated level that we saw in Q2. So I think we can we can look to see some some moderation emerge in Q3. So perhaps um, instead of reporting you know 100,000 units being lost week on week on week on week, um, we start to see some of those um, downtime announcements become moderated. Now, so why would we expect that over and above what we've um, we've ruled out in terms of further topical impacts? Well, I think we're, you know we are starting to uh, to see that many of the the major OEMs now are establishing sort of task forces um, and policies coming out of those task forces, which are allowing them to sort of you know mitigate. Uh, the, the worst effects of the constraints within the supply chain. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, we're seeing companies who are establishing teams that will look down through the supply chain to get a better sense of visibility um, to what they have um, within, a, within a reasonable level of, of supply. So rather than saying, you know, hey, we can't build anything unless we get sort of a 2x supply from the semiconductor industry, folk, they know they're not going to get that in, in the short term. So what they'll do is that, you know, they're trying to focus on, okay, you know, better understanding what parts, semiconductors, MCUs, etc., they have available and how can they best allocate those to their factories uh, and vehicle programs. And I think, you know, we use the evidence here of perhaps General Motors, um, but I think they're, they're sending much more a beat about how they've performed in the, towards the end of the, the second quarter and their outlook for the third quarter is improving. And, you know, they are putting it down to that kind of behavior becoming uh, more, more efficient. Um, you know, the, the evidence has been in, you know, some of the downtime, which was being tracked through Q2, um, you know, we're, we're now seeing communication to suggest that, you know, additional downtime is uh, is being removed, uh, and some facilities are going back to full operations ahead of what was previously scheduled. So, you know, the, I guess you know the more widespread that kind of activity becomes across not just GM but across across other OEMs as well, um, it's going to allow us to uh, kind of do more with with the, the less which has become available. Um, and I think you know Q4 would expect that trend to uh, to continue you know hopefully we get closer to something which i think you know phil and i would would appreciate and that's where you get the you know a, b a better alignment in, in terms of uh demand from the manufacturing supply side and supply of course from the semiconductor si side of things so if we can get to that kind of point then hopefully you know q4 is perhaps it's a time frame where we can expect to see some stabilization um, and that could be a prelude to perhaps, you know, early 2022, where we can possibly start to think about recovering lost volumes. But I would say that it's got to be done against a reasonable level uh, of demand being signaled by uh, by the automakers down to the supply base. Because if we see, um, you know, if we go through a scenario where, you know, um, demand levels are being um, exaggerated, um, there is a, you know, there's a fear that we won't get that trust. You won't get that balance um, established between automaker and supply chain. And it really, it's not going to help us move forward with alignment. So I think that's how we're, uh, we're expecting the second half and the early part of 2022 uh, to play out at the moment. Mm -hmm. And you touched on a lot of great points. Um, you know, I think the industry takes every opportunity, uh, every challenge is an opportunity to learn and whether it's, you know, a 
some type of destructive, you know, fire, tornado, et cetera, at a manufacturing facility, you know, and, and years ago in GM's case to learn how to be more flexible from a manufacturing and production um, standpoint, these supply just disruptions, you know, what, what can they do? So these, these efforts have been underway for some time, but they have been accelerating. And to your point, Mark, um, that visibility is so important, but also the agility and flexibility to be able to move things around to manage their businesses through these inevitable storms. So, you know, you certainly talked about it from an OEM perspective. Phil, you know, when you look at it, we also need to look at the supplier uh, side of these things. And as Mark kind of alluded to, they have to manage their business through these things. They have to be able to supply and be prepared to capitalize on um, the return of growth and, and opportunity, but they also need to mitigate risk. So what what are some suppliers doing to um, protect themselves? As you know, Mark mentioned, OEMs are clamoring for more. Consumer electronics and retailers' uh, needs are, are ramping up and heating up. Um, how are they avoiding this risk and and really navigating through this potential you know whiplash effect? Yeah. So what what we're seeing, at least in the short term, is the 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 semiconductor suppliers are trying to to move automotive to some models that um, the semiconductor guys the foundry guys have used um, outside of automotive so they're getting you know much longer firm commit windows so in the past the uh, the, the OEMs the tier ones would give a, a firm commit of, of product demand for say 12 weeks they're now um, the semiconductor suppliers are now extending that to 12 months, 18 months. So it gives them um, greater visibility. It gives the, uh, the the OEMs tier ones less flexibility because if you're predicting that far out, it's not like you can continue to change that demand within that window, hence the, the term firm. Um, so within that 12 weeks, excuse me, within that 12 months, within that 18 months, minimal changes to that demand. It gives the semiconductor companies much more visibility uh, for for planning purposes. Uh, in some cases, the semiconductor companies are even asking for prepayments um, so that they know that not only is that demand real, but um, regardless of, of how it all plays out, you know that um, there's, a, there's a real commitment there from their customer to take that um, when the when the time frame is correct. Um, so those are things that are happening right now. I just want to touch on a point that that Mark brought up. You know, the the other issue, which is probably going to be a little longer term to address, is you know there's there's a thing that we've affectionately deemed the the toilet paper effect on the demand side. So, you know, when you're in an allocation mode, um, you you want more of whatever it is you can't have. So the, the demand um, increases even if there isn't a real need for it. There's a flip side of that. We haven't figured out what to call it yet, which is the the OEMs looking back to the supply chain and having enough confidence that when they get a commitment, whether it's you know 12 weeks out or 12 months out, they get a commitment from the the semiconductor suppliers that they can bank on that commitment. And and right now, um, the, the the semiconductor suppliers are skeptical of some of the demand signals that they're seeing from the OEMs. And I think perhaps appropriately so, the OEMs are looking at what's happened this year uh, and said, you know, they're not terribly confident that all the commitments they're getting from the supply chain they can bank on. And it's that that gap between them that's that's really causing a, a reduction of trust between both sides. And, and that's going to become the, the more difficult thing to manage through, because if you're not trusting the information, it's hard to make good, solid decisions. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a great point. So final question, and I know you guys touched on this. Are there any other areas of concern you'd highlight? Um, I think the lasting effects as we work through this and uh, we learn to trust, I'm sure there'll be some stops and starts. Uh, is there anything else you'd, you'd highlight, you know, other than the 17 year cicada? I don't know what our plan is for that, but. <laughs> um, do you know, in a way, Kristen, it's, you know, the semiconductor shortages have absolutely dominated, um, you know, I guess a certain view of the industry. Um, and, you know, there are potentially other 
supply chain issues at large. Um, you know, we've had colleagues talk about, you know, what's going on with, uh, you know, with steel supply and the you know, pressure on, on, on pricing there. Again, it, it's, it's not as pervasive and destructive as what we're seeing happening with the uh, semiconductor supplies. Um, you know, there's still some concerns about availability of, you know, plastics and resins for the automotive sector as well. So <clears throat> I think semiconductors will continue to uh, to dominate surely for the for the next six months or so. But I guess it does raise a concern that perhaps as some of the disruption within semiconductors subsides, are we going to start to see that we're actually exposed to other supply chain disruptors? Right. Yeah. Right. As the water uh, level goes down, what what are the next icebergs that are going to be yeah. encountered? It's kind of thing. Oh, you know what? What's the rubbish you're going to find on the beach when the tide goes out? Yeah. Yeah. You know, on the on the cicadas, Kristen, I I would go with deep frying. Um, but in terms <laughs> of the um, the the semiconductors, you know, we we've touched on a lot of the points, and this is not going to come as a surprise to anybody. But I heard it as recently as a couple of hours ago that um, there was one of the major semiconductor suppliers for automotive that had to shut down a facility for three days because of COVID, um, and the effect of that was two to three weeks worth of disruption on the output from that factory. So, you know, even though we talked about COVID started this whole thing, um, you know, so long as COVID is still out there, it is, you know, the, um, the it, it's the lurking threat that uh, if it gets a foothold, a new variant gets a foothold someplace, um, it can disrupt the, the production of uh, semiconductors, probably less at the front end at this point, more of an issue perhaps at the back end with assembly and um, and some of the ancillary effects like that. But, uh, you know, I, I think we're in a better place now than we were a few months ago. But, you know, I, I'm i not declaring victory on 2021 just yet in terms of semiconductor supply. Mm -hmm. Yep, fair enough, fair enough. Well, as, as Mark mentioned, um, you know, sales have been strong. And I would say that I'm sure Mark, Phil, and we've all seen the automotive industry has proven to be resilient, innovative, and collaborative when we have to be. So it'll it'll be an interesting next uh, several months as we get through this and, and face any new challenges that may crop up. But thank you both for joining me today. And we will be back with more Fuel for Thought next month. To opt into our newsletter that provides more information on this topic and others, visit ihsmarket.com forward slash auto newsletter.